All right. We've been doing the book of Romans. I'm excited. I, this is Romans 13 tonight. Amen. How many of you got Romans 13? You read it. You did a little peeking at Romans 13 t- earlier for the study tonight. Anybody? Anybody? Yes. Woo. Glory to God. Now, you know, as you read your notes there, it tells you what every chapter is about right on up. And then we're going to tell you what chapter 13 is about. So without looking, let me just throw one out. Chapter 6, Romans 6, what's it about? Who wants to guess? Now remember, this is supposed to be fun. Okay, go ahead, BJ. We're dead to sin, but alive through God in Christ. Amen. She looked at the notes. All right, without looking at the notes, what's chapter 2 about? Everybody's looking at the notes. Remember, religious people judging people that are not doesn't know God mostly specifically the Jews remember and remember that they were guilty of the same thing because all of sin and come short of the glory of God all right let's bring one one up what was chapter mm, what was chapter 12 about can anybody remember 12 that's last week's you were here last week were you I'm just joking with you yeah, it was basically how to be a living sacrifice, how to use your motivational gun, recognize them, see them in others, and how to live through God's love. You know, inside church and outside church. How many know that when you go to church, you leave your family problems at home? You come to get God, who's the answer of family problems anyway? God. Okay, and so you just think about it. All right, so let's go ahead. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. What a privilege it is. Father, we know in Isaiah 66 that you look to those that love your word, to those that tremble at it, those have a contrite spirit that are looking for your word and for you, God, to minister to their hearts. Father, tonight, let us receive this with the anointing. Let us learn what you have for us to to learn. And those coming in by uh, YouTube, coming in on the garage, that they may also learn the fathoms and all the good things that you have, Lord, said in this book. And we appreciate that. And chapter 13, in Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. amen. So let me go ahead and say, let's go all the way down to point. See the one down there in your notes? Because basically I just kind of, you know, rather than reading them every time you have them, okay? So your point, right, here in chapter 13, we will see how to submit to authority. Now, as you can see right now, there is a lot going on with the riots and people doing this and finding just about any kind of thing that they can to challenge authority. Now, listen to me. The Bible says for children, this is for children. We all were a child at one time. It says to honor your father and mother so that you can live long on the earth. So it says that sassy children actually live shorter than people that show respect. So you take that and you read the book of Peter. And Peter says, I'm just rambling here for a minute. He says, stay away from those that think it no problem to speak evil of dignitaries and have no problem of talking down to the authority. Well, Paul in chapter 13 addresses this because there's a right attitude for those in authority. Can you say amen? And then there's a wrong attitude. All right. Now, do you remember the the centurion that came to Jesus in the Gospels? Jesus was preaching. He came to Jesus and he says, oh, sir, come. My, my, my daughter lie home at sick. I think, no, my servant lie home at sick. And Jesus says, I will come and heal him. And he says, it's not necessary. You speak the word only. The point I'm trying to make is, he says, for I'm a man under authority and I have soldiers under me. So I'm under authority. I'm also giving orders. Now, that has to do with the balance that comes in with what Paul's going to say here in chapter 13. So let's read it again. We see how to submit to authorities, how to love our neighbor with Christ's love. Everyone say Christ's love, not my own. 
How many know? Because there's some neighbors that you couldn't love on your own. It takes an extra love. Can you say amen? No, I'm not me putting anything down. I mean, it's, it takes an extra godly love. Amen. You want to have a good marriage? Love your wife or husband with godly love. Man, it's rich. We won't go into detail, though. <laughs> All right, so teaching how to submit, amen, and how to love your neighbor with God's love. You see, God's love neutralizes the enemy. Remember Jesus said? I'm in still under point here. Okay, I'm still reading point, okay? Remember what Jesus said? The prince of this world cometh, and he can find nothing in me. Now, I, I was disturbed by that one time. What do you mean nothing? He came and he tempted you. What God was saying, what I believe he was saying, and for those coming in the camera, that God is love, and Satan can't touch love. That's why we're always encouraged by John, by others, to walk in love. But he's not talking about human love. He's saying talk with walking in love. And we found out, and we're going to find out later, that God is love. So when we walk in love, we're walking in God to do God's love. Can you say amen? So basically, in dealing with your neighbor, how to do it with God's love. And then finally, yeah, I got you love. And then finally, clothe yourself with Christ. Wake up out of your sleep. Put on the armor of light. Everyone say light. Chases away darkness. And, and, of course, the armor of light is the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and we're going to get to that scripture. So there's three main themes. How to submit to authorities and do it right. How to love our neighbor with Christ's love. Even the honorary ones. Okay, hello. Amen. And, finally, clothe yourself with Christ. Now, those three things, Christians today, I believe, are having a real struggle. Christians today don't know whether to get up in arms, our country's being taken over, how far do we go with all this, on and on and on. You know, it's just a big distraction. We need to be meeting with the captain of our salvation on a daily basis, so he gives us our marching orders. We might be part of the Christian group that doesn't go into the minefield. How are we going to know? If we don't spend time with the captain, the author and finisher of our faith. Say amen, somebody. <clears throat> All right. So let's begin to look at this. Now, the text. Now, you go to Romans 13. Put your finger there. I'm going to go to an opening text in Colossians. You know the scripture. It's a, it's a scripture that I think a lot of Christians haven't absorbed its true meaning. I'm not saying I have either, so please don't get me wrong, and you guys stop laughing over there. Okay, so it says in Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3, let me just read it to you. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, let me ask you this. You're Christians, you love the Lord. What makes you raised with Christ? What makes you raised with Christ? Faith in him. What, believe, what gets you to be raised with Christ? Being born again. Being born again. You, see, you all said it right. But what we want to do is reemphasize the term born again. If Jesus used that term, we can use that term. Right on. Give yourself a raise. You see, when you get born again, some powerful things happen. And I want to explain it. My pastor explained this. Not only does Jesus, God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come into your spirit, and he removes the Adam satanic nature in your spirit and brings himself in there, but then takes your spirit and raises it and put in Christ and sits it at the right hand. So here you have your spirit in you, but you're also sitting in, in Christ in heavenly places. And you've got to see the dual citizenship. Can you say amen? amen? And the idea what the enemy wants to do with us is he wants us to, to, to be thinking a lot about our position here on earth. And we forget about that position in Christ in heaven. 
So this scripture will make a lot of sense to you. He says, if you are raised with Christ and you are, you're born again. Seek, crave, look after, desire after those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, put your mind on a set Think this way on things above, not on things on the earth. Remember, we're like a Polaroid camera. If you're conscious of your faults, then you're fault conscious. If you're conscious of the love of God at a particular time, then you're love of God conscious. Whatever you focus on long enough is going to affect you to some degree. So the idea is, we get up in the morning, we meet with God, we focus on God, God, now we, God's got our attention, and then when something comes up, we don't focus on it as a problem, we focus on Jesus for the solution. It becomes naturally or supernaturally a flow. Can you say amen? So again, if you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Why? Not on things of the earth. For you are dead. Hey, my first date, they were dead. No, <laughs> they were, You are dead and your life is what? Hidden. 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 From who? Yeah, from the devil. You're hidden from the devil. If you walk in the spirit, if you walk with God in the spirit realm, which we're going to cover tonight, you're hidden. That's why the devil doesn't leap on you when you're filled with God. You notice the devil never attacks you when you're singing and maybe speaking in tongues and you're rejoicing. He's not anywhere near you. So when you get down, he, he moves your focus over on something maybe negative. Now you're talking about it like the conversation tonight almost got off. You know, talking about something we can't change. You know what I mean? He looks for that. Are you catching me? All right, so set your mind on things above, okay? For you are dead, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You're covered. All right, here we go. Submitting to governing authorities. Not just government, but governing authorities. Can you say amen? amen. If you ever come up on an accident and there's a police officer there, who's the governing authority? The police officer. The police officer. Pay attention, don't get in the way. All right, so you're beginning to see. So how do we take this? So let's listen to what Paul says. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Hello? So Hitler. What about that, Pastor Kerry? Mussolini. How about some of these guys we... We call leaders. God says he's in charge of that. How does that work, Pastor Kerry? Works this way. The people put whom they want in power. Well, how do they go about doing that? Well, let me explain. Pay close attention. If you are an anti-God person, then everything you want, everything you say, everything you think is going to want somebody who doesn't know God in power. If you think God is the enemy, Satan has convinced you that God is the enemy, he's the one that's causing all those problems, then some people will think that, why should I have God in my life? And so people with certain attitudes, they will collectively put in power who they think they should. And so that's why all through history, we have some people who took power, on their own. They usurped it. We have some people that were put in power by dum-dums for selfish reasons. And there are other nations that vote their people into power. That is, if their voting is correct. Right? Like third world countries and all. So, somebody like Hitler, who put Hitler in power? The people. And Satan sealed the deal. He was, a, he was a devil worshiper. Saint, uh, Hitler was in the occult, and he actually was, was in an anti-God thing. And so when you're anti-God, first thing you want to kill is the Jews, then the Christians. 
Hello? Uh, I just found out by doing more research that actually Hitler was a Jew. At one time? There you go. Remember, the devil will make you crazy. If you listen and don't control your thoughts, the devil can land on your head and make you crazier and a loon. So for your children, if you're watching your children, if they suddenly have a personality change, start doing weird things, sit them down and have a talk. Don't let that get out of hand. You let it get out of hand, that person will turn into something they're, they'll be afraid of all their life of themselves. They'll drink, they'll do those things because they don't like who they are. Sit down and have a talk with them. I did with my children. Guaranteed it was tough. All right, moving right along, let's get it. It's a short chapter, folks. That's why I'm talking a little bit, okay? Now, so it says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So now you don't have a problem with that, do you? If the people want it, God will grant it. Romans 1. Don't forget Romans 1. They, did, they knew God, but they didn't want it. God, so God gave them over. Okay, do you got the answer there? Because some people stumble over this thing. Don't you stumble. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. So, folks, even if those who are in authority are wrong, if you get up, have an attitude, you get all over the internet, and you start slamming this and slamming that, guess what? You're going to bring judgment right down on yourself. And Satan don't care. You might be absolutely right. And you got the thing in there, and you're up on the hand, and you're just doing all of a sudden, it seems like all hell is breaking loose on you. So Satan says, oh yeah, you're under attack. No, you're not. You brought judgment on yourself, because your job is to give it to God, pray, and then live a happy, great witness. Go lay hands on the sick. Go preach the gospel, and get your eyes back on Jesus, and off of the world. Can you say amen? amen. I'm done preach myself good. All right, I don't know if I am, but <clears throat> all right, let's look at this thing now. Okay, and it says, for, for rulers are not a terror to the good works, but to evil, right? Supposedly. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do you want, excuse me, do what is good and you will have praise from the same. I remember one time, I tell you a quick story. I had become, at one time during high school, the public enemy number one kid in Buckley. And I went to school with the police chief, and he did not like me at all. And he was one of those bullies. And he became the police chief. I won't mention any names. He used to hang me up on my locker, him and his buddies, when I was a freshman, on my belt. I'd be swinging by the locker because I was a little scrawny guy. And that he didn't like me at all. So when I got saved, because when I would drive through town to Enumclaw or something like that, I'd always be looking in the rearview mirror. You know, I wasn't saved then. And sure enough, they'd see my car. I had a really hot car. And they'd be following me. They pulled me over one time for not having a light on my license plate. Just petty things, you know. And then I got saved. I forgot all about it. And then one day, I'm going through Buckley. My church was in Buckley. I'm coming through Buckland. There was the police right behind me. And immediately I went through all those emotions. Oh, what if they pull me over? All oh, my mind was going on. This is what I'm trying to relate to you. And suddenly I realized, hey, I'm saved. Now I'm asking, pull me over. I'll tell you about Jesus. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's having the right attitude. And looking at the authorities as they are there for our peace. They're there to threaten evil. Can you say amen? Now, sure, there are some bad apples in every crate. But doesn't, you don't throw the crate away because of a bad apple. And we see in society right now, people turning bad because they see one or two bad apples. And so they're going to go out and tell everybody they don't like it. And so they're just going to become a bad apple like that. We don't deal with authorities that way. Can you say amen? Because judgment comes on them. One thing for others to judge you 
But it's another thing for God to put judgment on you. Okay. Because a person that doesn't obey authorities, what are they teaching everybody else? Disobedience, Disobedience and rebellion, right? Amen. So, let us walk properly, it says then. All right? So it goes on, it goes further. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience sake. Verse 8, okay? For, I think, no, verse 6, sorry. For because of his, or this, you also pay taxes. Oh, oh here we go. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Well, supposedly, our people in Washington... People over here in Olympia, we pay taxes. They're supposed to be protecting us, working on our behalf. Everyone say amen. amen. They're there for our good. Nobody say anything snide because then you'd be, <laughs> you know, in trouble. Okay, so they're there attending it continually what's supposed to be good. Verse 7, render therefore to all their due. If you have a good person, say, that's a good person. If you don't know much about them, just say, well, I don't know much about them. Okay. Give their due taxes to whom taxes are due. Honor customs to whom customs are due. Listen, if you're over at somebody's house and they're a vegetarian, you know, don't talk down about vegetarians. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Folks, do you know... We're to honor one another. Really, we are. And it's good to honor one another. You ever watch people, the Japanese are bowing? How about, uh, what was it, what, shot in the dark? Where he had that, that assistant and he bows and the assistant bows and the bowing and the bowing. How about the one, um, uh, Don Knotts and Tim Conway on, um, what was it, Private Eyes? And they, and they couldn't stop bowing the one guy. They just kept bowing. It's so funny. Anyway, let's move on by. Show people respect. Give honor to whom honors do. Amen? All right. So a couple of points underneath. Number one, authority is given by God and put into place by him. So if you rebel against it, who are you really rebelling against? God. To resist and to rebel will bring judgment down on you. It's a serious thing to resist and have that kind of spirit, that spirit of rebellion. In fact, read it in Leviticus, I think it's 19. It says that rebellion is the spirit of witchcraft. Okay, all right. Point two, the authorities are there to protect us. Say amen, somebody. And to serve us, right? They're to serve the righteous and to bring vengeance upon those who do evil. And then point three, this is why you pay taxes. To support our police and support our firemen, right? Those who serve the government are there to help and to protect us. Render what is due to each one. Those to whom taxes, those to whom customs, fear, and then honor. All right, let's drop down. Christ's love in action. How many know as we sow, so shall we reap? So if you want to give out a crabby day, you're going to reap another crabby day. I don't want to pray for some crop failure. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Love in action. Uh, Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 8. Owe no man anything. Let's stop right there. What are you going to do about your car payment? House payment? Is that what he's referring to? He's No, he's not referring to that. He's saying, don't tick somebody off and don't ever be in a position of not apologizing. Hello. If you purposely tick somebody off, I, I think that's a proper term, I'm, make somebody mad, then you should be man or woman enough to apologize. Can you say amen? Owe oh, no one anything. Don't owe people apologies. Don't run around saying I'm sorry all the time. If you, if you messed up once, say I'm sorry once, please. Don't go, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Somebody want to drop kick you Jesus, you know. Hello. Nonsense. Now, when I hear sorry like that, I think you're faking it. Hello. I don't know for sure. Okay, so let's catch this. So basically, 
Two, the authorities are there to protect us, all right? And then three, this is why we pay taxes. All right, let's go down farther again. It goes on to owe no one anything but to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the what? Okay, who's love? God is love, right? What did Jesus do? He fulfilled the law. So let's look at this way. If we learn to walk in Jesus' love, that's what Paul is saying. He's not considering human love. In fact, these people, when they wrote, they, held, they very seldom used the terms. There's three terms for love other than God's agape love. And they very seldom use that term. So every time they're talking about loving others, oh, no mess, he's talking about with God's ability in you, love them. Say amen. amen. So he says, uh, I lost my space right there. Verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. How I many of you are loving with Jesus? You're not going to think of that. You shall not murder, right? Oh, no one anything except to love one another. He who loves one another, fulfill the law. The commandments are what? Not commit adultery. Do not murder. Shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Lie. Accuse somebody. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm does no harm, excuse me, to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Pretty much says the whole thing there, doesn't it? So what kind of love are we talking about? Agape love, God's love. Now, when Jesus said, he who slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other. Do you know why he actually said that? Well, the law says an eye for an eye. To somebody slap you on the right cheek, you turn around and punch him in the face. Okay, that's what the law said. Get him back. But Jesus didn't say that, did he? He said, somebody slaps you on the cheek, he says, turn the other. Well, how are you going to turn the other? God's love. Guaranteed. When you love somebody, I can give you this testimony. You can look it for yourself. Google um, uh, crossing the switch braid. When, uh, when uh, David Wilkinson got into Nikki Cruz's face and say, if you cut me up into pieces, every one of my pe pieces are going to say it loves you. And it broke him down and he got saved. Remember that? You see, that love of God overpowers any kind of aggressiveness. Don't forget what we first said. Love neutralizes Satan. Doesn't it say a quiet answer turns away wrath? You see, all that has to do with love. Okay, so let's go on. I love this part. So he says, he who does not love does not know God, right? All right, so let's go on. It says, and this is why we pay taxes. Because I love my government. And then he goes on to this part, all right? Um, love does not harm, does no harm to your neighbor. Finally, point two, right? God who is in us, when left, in charge of us will not sin, correct? And the lust of the flesh is subject to Christ in us, in the spirit. So the lust of the flesh cannot war against the spirit, and the spirit cannot war against the flesh, right? If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we walk in Christ, you're going to fulfill the law, and you're not going to react, you're going to respond. Wouldn't it be better to respond to someone who's angry than to react? Yeah. Your doctor gives you medicine. Wouldn't it be better if you responded to the medicine rather than react to the medicine? Jesus, isn't he medicine? Wouldn't it be better to respond with Jesus than to react in yourself? You got the point. All right, so let's go on. All right, so... Love does no harm. True love is God. All right? So the love of God in us will do harm to no one. It's not in your heart to hurt anybody. Did you know that? 
It's not within your heart to do that. That's why you're to walk in the spirit. <clears throat> now, in your mind, you can think of a thing or two. <laughs> in your flesh, I knew a, a wonderful, wonderful person that if, when they got in the flesh, they said, it's danger, danger, danger. They would, they would say, danger, danger, get away from me. I'm in the flesh. So that means don't irritate him. Give him the space and you'll get that taken care. Well, at least he could recognize that situation, you know. All right, so let's go on. So let's deal with love in 1 John 4, 7 through 11. I threw that scripture in, the, in your notes there. If you'll go to 1 John, we have a song about that. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God. And knoweth God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Be he loved, let us love one another, for John 7 and 8, 4, 7 and 8. All right, so in 1 John 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. Now you know he's using the word agape. Everyone that can love this way has been born of God. If you don't read it right, you lose that. Well, I love. How come I'm not getting that? Well, not in Jesus' love. You've got to release God's love, okay? He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this, the love of God is manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. See that term? I love the King James because in a lot of translations, they do they use the word through. By they use, by him, like he's some tool. No, through him. Because you can't go to the Father except through Christ. Right? Through him, all right? So hopefully you get that. I love those little words, you know. And, and it says, um, only begotten son that shall live through him. And then it says in 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. God so loved the world, right? And sent his son to be a perpetuation for our sins. How many here don't know what a perpetuation is? I didn't want that for the first 10 years of my Christianity. It means a way in which the Father is accepted. Jesus became the way of salvation. And the Father accepted it because it was done perfectly. So that's what a perpetuation is. Amen. If you paid 10 bucks and you paid your debt, that's a perpetuation to your debt. It's accepted. Your debt's paid. Right? The IRS calls you and says, if you paid the $500, you won't have to pay the $5,000. So you pay the $500 and guess what? It's a perpetuation. It's accepted. Hello? I just used a term probably the IRS doesn't even know anything about. <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay. Put on the armor of light. Everyone say, put on the armor of light. Let me ask you, how do you do that? There's one got it right. How do you get put on the armor of light? Father, in the name of Jesus. I guess that would be prayer, but it'd be more like you know what you're doing. You know, is that you, when you're going to take a shower, you're going to put on the shower, right? You got to turn the knobs. <laughs> you're going to put on the armor of light. Then you got a Father in Jesus' name, which is exactly what you said, sister. Right? Father, in the name of Jesus, you're hidden in Christ and God. You're in the secret place, right? Now, you got to get your mind used to the way that the people understood it back the day it was written. Because the very thing I'm explaining to you is the very way they, they can see that nobody could touch them unless they got in the flesh. So they went off doing everything they can with boldness and strength. Why? Because God's got them covered. Yeah. They weren't carousing around and being afraid. No, they were bold. Why? Because they knew they were covered. Christians today, we get this milk toast gospel. 
and you think you got holes in your armor and God saved you, but not quite all there. And so there's some openings that, you know, the enemy's going to get some pot shots in. And, you know, that's just a lie. The only reason he gets pot shots in because you keep like a Sasquatch, keep peering out of yourself and getting whacked. And before we, here's the key, before we peer out, we make a lot of noise and so we attract the shot. It's called fleshing out. All right, let's go back. All right, so say, walking in love. So again, it says in Romans 13, 11, and do this knowing the time. Folks, have you checked the time lately? What time do you think we are in God's time? These are the end times, I would say. Now, if they were wrote it way back then, they thought it was the end times way back then. It's a form of rain, right? So do this, knowing the time. How many here know if your appointment's at four, you know in the time, how long does it take you to get ready? How long does it take you to get there? How long do you have to wait when you're there? Hey, Christian, do you know the time? And knowing this, knowing the time, that it's high time to awake out of sleep. Really bothers me when I see people sleeping through something they need to listen to. Probably bothers you too. Because they're in a stupor and they don't know it. Can't understand why the devil keeps him up all Saturday night. Hello. You know, if it happened once in a while, I'd be no, no problem. But it happens every time. Any kind of a pattern that it's negative and keeps you from God is a demonic pattern. It's either caused directly by a de devil or influenced by a devil. Okay? And it's a pattern because the pattern keeps playing over and over and over again. It's the wise Christian that wakes up and says, oh, well, I'm being deceived here. Sister, pray with me about this. I keep doing this over and over again, and then I want to fight and argue with everybody when they tell me I'm being dumb. Now, I'm not talking to any of you. You're okay. Can you say amen? But that's how we are sometimes. All right? Wake up out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Can you believe Christians do in darkness? Yeah, take a little wine. Little Christians goofing around, acting like the world, don't think that God's watching. Now, I'm not putting them down because somebody, they need a little reproof and stuff like that. But listen, if you have to sneak and you have to hide doing those kind of things, but rethink about it. Now, I'm not picking on anybody because every human being, everyone say every human being, every has, their has their secrets. And only God knows and they do. Okay? All right? And, and nobody else needs to know about them. Yeah, they don't need to know about anything. That's all right, Joe. <laughs> it's all right, Joe. He says, that's all right, Joe. Anyway, <clears throat> the idea is, so that's why Jesus says, don't judge one another. Don't look at the speck in somebody else. And instead, look at your own speck. If we did time with God, looking at our specs and asking God to give us, envision us for the future, we wouldn't have time to, to do anything but love other people. Hello? But because we're insecure on ourselves, we're, we're doing all this kind of stuff, we look at other people through our own eyes instead of God's eyes, and we think, well, I lie a little bit, maybe they do too. I promise things, and I don't keep my word, maybe they do that too. You know, it's just human, what we call it, worldly wisdom. It's sensual and devilish, you know, it's no big deal. It's our flesh. But here's the great thing. Nobody needs to know your private business but God. Or your husband if you're living in a house together. 
And you need to protect. Here's another thing. I'll throw this one out. No charge. Do not narc on your husband or your wife. Don't complain ever about your husband and don't complain ever about your wife unless it's a counselor or somebody you want prayer for. Because if you do that, you're betraying them. And it didn't say in your vows until betraying do his part. <laughs> so we got to kind of watch that because that's a real loose end for a lot of Christians. Uh, my husband's on my case today. Just making, making something up. Okay, let's move on. Remember me, I listen to the Holy Spirit. Something leaks out and kind of gets on your feet and stomp, stomp, stomp a little bit. It's not because I'm reading your mail. It's because the Holy Spirit is. And you want to hear something that's going to provoke you to change. Okay, that's called a conviction. So I'm not slamming you and beating you up and thinking that I've arrived and you haven't. Forget that silly nonsense. Are, are you kidding? I'm under construction too. You know what I mean? And what's fun is we're all under construction together, but things are getting built. Yes. All right, so let's go right on past this. Now look at, okay, let's cast off the work of darkness. That's our flesh, folks. That's all that is. And if you want to know how bad the flesh can be, read Galatians chapter 5, where it says the lusts of the flesh, is our, the works of the flesh are the yeast, and it lists a bunch of nasty things there just before the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, let's cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Father, in Jesus' name, katong. Light chases away darkness, right? What's the speed of darkness? There isn't any. Until light's turned on. Then it runs away at 186,000 miles per second. Put on the armor of light. Do you think then you have to punch the devil? No, when you put on the armor of light, it punched the devil. It shot it right between the eyes when you stuck the armor of light on. Because the armor of light is somebody, not something. All right, let's go on. So let us cast off the work of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly or circumspectly. In other words, be sober when you're walking through the day. As in the day, not in rivalry partying. You know, certain party people, you see them on Facebook and they got a wine and a beer and they're praising the Lord, you know, come on. Don't do that. Let's walk properly as of the day, not rivalry or in drunkenness, not in lewdness. Do you know what lewdness is? Being rude. Just being grossly rude, you know, and lust, not in strife. You know what strife is? I don't have to explain, right? That's people picking on each other, strife. And then it gets escalating. Amen? That's Satan's power right there. He turns people against each other. Let's say Peggy thinks I'm mad at her. So she says, why are you mad at me? And I say, I'm not mad at you. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes. And you see, even if something silly like that, he feeds off of it. So the best thing, if, if something's irritating you, try to hold your peace. Try to ask for God's wisdom. I tell my wife, I says, honey, I'm a little upset right now. Let's back, back away. Hello? Back away a little bit. She gets it. You know, I used to carry a sign around saying, <laughs> well, seriously, why, why keep drumming something down when they got the point? And I used to do that a lot. So let's move past that, okay? And, you know, stripe. Okay, envy, envy. Here's this hidden thing called strife. Did you know envy is a type of strife? When you envy somebody and say, they don't deserve that, I deserve that. It's a type of strife. It's a subtle thing. Okay, let's go past that. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. How many know that if you let your flesh go, it'll do anything now, within a reason, you know, within reason. If I let my flesh go, you know, when I was in the world, I'd go get drunk. And then I'd drink too much, and then I'd end up hugging, you know, the, the porcelain god, you know, and do stupid things. When we're kids, we just go to the, we go and get a keg and go to a kegger and spend the whole evening throwing up, trying to be cool. Tried to smoke a cigarette when I was young. We were working volunteer in the summertime. 
out of high school at Rainier State School. Beautiful place. And what was neat about them, they had some great cooks. So you got a meal and a half. And so we'd go and volunteer for a half an hour, play with the kids, and they'd feed us, and then we'd go home. Well, everybody there was trying the cigarette thing, right? So I decided I was going to be a macho man, and I lit up a cigarette. You know, it's one of those ones with the hollow filters, Vantage or whatever. Not, I don't think they make them anymore. I'm not trying to give a commercial. I took a couple of puffs. I turned green, and I was sick the rest of the day. Thank God. Anything I get that terribly sick about, I never touch again. Amen. So, you know, so why do we have to learn the hard way, you know? Let's learn the easy way. Amen. So anyway, I don't believe you should do really anything to shorten your life. I mean, your life's short enough as it is, thanks to Adam, you know, and uh, then the canopy in Noah's time. Because in Noah's time, before Noah's canopy in the rain and all, people lived hundreds of years. And then after that, 120 is a max. So, and, and, and people, back some years in the 1800s, 40, 45 was it. And I'll look at it now. What is it, 70 is a new 60 or something like that? Anyway, I'm rambling a little bit because I got, a, I got ahead of everything. Notice that we're almost done. All right, so have you learned anything? Let's go through these points, okay? One through three. Okay, point one. Notice Paul says that do this. Here's the key. Folks, you can't think about doing something when it's the gospel. You have to think about, if you think about doing it, the scripture says, if you know to do it and don't do it, what is it? Sin. So if you think not to do something, well, that's pretty good, but you know, I'm not going to do that. If God asks you to do it, you do it. And you do it pronto. Pronto. Because what you don't realize is God wants to see how faithful you've been. You've been saying all week long how faithful you are and you're so glad. Well, God asked you now to do something and you didn't. Watch out. Next time he asks you, it's going to be a while. Well, why is that? Is God being unfair with me? No, you were unfair with God. Why would he ask you to do something if you're not going to do it? So he'll try you again. But you better pay close attention the second time. Oh, me, everybody. And teenagers and young people need to pay attention to this, okay? I know my dad used to sit down and have some real nice talks with me. I always used to think he was lecturing me. Now, since he's gone on to be with the Lord, I know he was telling me his best. He was giving him me his best advice. And, and, and you know what? I take it to heart now. All right, so, two, Christians cast off the works of darkness. Get out of the flesh. Stop living like the world in its corruption. In other words, keep yourself unspotted from the world. I had a dream once, and it was right when I first got saved. I was about six months in. I'd have these terrible dreams. Nobody taught me how to plead the blood of Jesus over my dreams. So I'd have devils jump on my chest and grabbed me and I couldn't talk in my dreams. I had all kinds of this crazy stuff in my dreams. I would have this, you know, and I would be, what is going on? And then God began to teach me how to plead the blood of Jesus over my dreams. You know, and the funny thing is, you know, when you're trying to battle in your dream, it seems like you're always losing. But then someday when you got the name of Jesus or sometime during the dream, you speak the name of Jesus and you got the victory. Why go through all of that? Amen? Let us walk properly. Point three, let us walk properly, not in the flesh and its lusts, but in the spirit. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't give in to your flesh. Amen? All right, so Romans 8, 34 through 39 tells us if we can walk in this love, we can walk in Christ Here's what happens. Who is he who condemns? Who's our condemner? Satan. Satan is. And if others start condemning you for whatever reason, you know who's telling them. When people start complaining about something three or four months earlier they thought the world of, you know who's gotten in their head. 
get it out real quick or they're going to be spiritually vomiting up negative stuff. And we call it staph infection. If you're giving people rides and you're having people help you, don't complain one time about your family, your church. Don't want make one complaint because if a person's negative and you make one slight complaint, that will seal it. Now there's more than them that think this. You know, and Satan is very crafty at using an unsuspecting Christian who's ignorant of things they shouldn't be to harm another person. And believe me, I've harmed enough in my life to know better than to do those things. Another thing people do is they get in with a husband-wife situation and they start discussing the church and the husband situation. And pretty soon you're not in agreement with good blessings on the church. You're starting to criticize it, pick on its thing. And next thing you know, you're doing yourself and the church a misfavor because you're feeding energy to the devil to attack the church. So you want to avoid that. Say amen. All right. Who is he that condemns Satan is? It is Christ who died. Yeah, rather. Also is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Because of this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Or distress? No. Everyone say no with me. Or persecution? No. Or famine? No. Or nakedness? No. Or peril? No. Or sword? No. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. Ministers. You see, I am dying to give you the word. In other words, the enemy doesn't leave me alone. And especially if I'm going to give out the word. So on a Wednesday and a Sunday, who do you think he tries to hammer? That's why I ask you, pray for the service all week long. For it to go well and the blessings that we have glistening. The angels show up. Everything. Every time. Pray for it. Pray for your leaders. Now, last week, I could tell I was totally prayed for. Covered tremendously for some reason. In other weeks, I can tell when just like crickets, crickets. Now, thank God I pray, so I'm not waiting for other people to pray. But when everybody starts praying, gets in agreement, loses all the little stuff, and just really ask God, God can show up, manifest, blow us away. But we're not unified. We're not focused like we need to be. Set aside six minutes, ten minutes. That's all you do is pray for the services. A whole ten minutes. Get your timer out. And start praying over equipment, praying over everybody. And just start lab laboring in prayer. We're going to teach you about that coming up Sunday. How to, how to give birth and prayer on things. All right, so let's finish up with this scripture. All right. It says, oh, we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him. Notice it says through him, not by him, through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death or life, angels, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you got something out of that tonight, give the Lord a praise, will you? Yay!